tube. Yes, we are. We are live on the tube, on the tele. Uh, for everybody light down a little here, bit. So. There we go. <laughs> I had to turn my light down. My my forehead was a little bit glowing. <laughs> well, you know that's okay. It's better. It, you got some. You got some stuff on the top of it. There, it's not quite bald there for everything. Turning gray or turning loose. It's uh, <laughs> either way. It's good. All right, everyone. Well, hey, we are honored to have the the man, the myth, the podcasting legend, and the the. The man who's done more bar mitzvahs than anybody I know. <laughs> oh, I'm going to, I'm going to share a little bit about that. If you're okay with that too. Oh, totally fine with it. Uh, uh, our buddy Doug here, he is the, the founder of turnkey podcast production. He's the host of nice guys on business podcast, thousand plus episodes, everybody with millions of downloads. And one of the great things that I love about Doug is that uh, he is a, a student of podcasting himself, always looking to do better, always looking to expand his audience and uh, not afraid to ask questions and be coachable out there, which I think is one of the best signs of a good podcast launch or production manager out there is somebody who's is coachable and willing to ask great questions and also listen and then apply those things. And he's done a great job. We've got people on here that have worked with Doug. Uh, I've known Doug for about a year, uh, actually going on about two years now and absolutely just love his energy. He, he's a life of the party wherever he goes, but he is focused on monetization, growing communities and building influence. And so we're honored to have uh, DJ Doug Sandler join us early this morning from wow. LA. Yeah, man. I appreciate you having me on, Scott. And please don't leave me quite yet. Are you going to hang out with me? Or are you? Yeah, I, I can hang out. What I'll do is when you sh share your screen, I'll just drop off and still be here. Um, if we got any Q and A stuff like that, but, uh, once you go to your PowerPoint, I'll probably just sit in the back and then field questions for you. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. That's, that sounds good. And thank you everybody for, I don't know where everybody is coming from. So maybe, uh, is your chat box working? Or are we yep. sharing? Are we that? Got, okay. uh, they can Q and A they can ask, they can, uh, uh, chat Great. with our, with our speakers. Yep. yep. Um, we've got people from as far as New Zealand, uh, wow. England, Knoxville, um, where else we got people from Georgetown, Texas, just up the road here. Um, people from LA, people from where else? San Antonio. Wow. Um, okay. All over the place. East totally. All yeah, over it's, the place. It's, it's quite the melting pot of podcasters. Well, and what I found when I started pot and Scott, thank you so much for, for having me on, you know, they always say that, what is it? The early bird gets the worm. If that's yep. the case, I, I, I'm going to let that worm go. Cause I, 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 ha I am the toughest guy to get up early in the morning. But when I saw, when uh, you invited me on to the uh, mass media podcast summit, I remember there was probably about seven or eight slots open and there was a couple of really good slots available. And then JJ and I, JJ Flazanes, as you know, was my girlfriend and, uh, and an excellent podcaster as well. I had to, I had to fall on the sword. I had to take the 7.30 AM so that she could have the, uh, the 7, 7 PM slot or the 6.30 PM slot. So I'm happy to be here. I wish it was a little bit more noontime my time, but it is early. So Pardon me as you're listening to this, if I'm stumbling over any of the words and, and doing my thing. And Scott, feel free as, as any kind of comments come in or questions come in, just break in. Even if I'm in the, um, the PowerPoint, just go ahead and feel free to break in and, and, uh, and share the comment because I'd love to be able to answer it as we go along. Will do. Uh, yeah. And, and thank you again for having me here. And I, I so appreciate this kind of stuff. And, and I love being a student, although I was never a good student in, uh, in high school. I mean, honestly, so if you're listening to this, and you scored anywhere between 800 and 900 on your SATs, old school SATs. If you have a two point, uh, between a 1.8 and a 2.3 uh, GPA in high school or college, you're in the right spot because even you can have a mid six figure or seven figure income as poorly as I was a student. I am a great student of podcasting and I learn and absorb and sponge up everything I can when it comes to the stuff that I love, so, which is probably why I did very poorly in, uh, in college other than the dating scene. I did very well in the dating scene, but beyond that, it was not good. <laughs> so uh, let's see, let me start, I guess, I, here, let me get, I'll, let me do this organized, because if I don't, I'll probably end up getting, uh, JJ's like, just keep straight with everything that you say. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, all right, I'm gonna do it. Let me share my screen, let's figure out how to do that. Okay, share screen, got that, sharing it. All right, are you seeing my screen now? I do. You just need to go in presentation mode. There you go. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hit present. Let's see how if that works for Perfect. this. I want to reduce it just a little bit so I have access to some of the some of the slides. So you're seeing like the corners of my my yep. screen too, right? Okay. Yep. All right. This will cool. This this will work here. And let me just make sure. All right. Very good. Oh yeah. You already see I'm getting a gift. So uh, Scott invited me on, and we actually have a um, a class that we teach 
called the Ultimate Podcast Launch Formula. We have a masterclass that we do. This is the first one that we have coming up, but I've taught this so many times that I love the idea of teaching either people that are brand new into podcasting or in the podcasting space and, uh, and want to figure out a little bit more about how to grow their community, how to build influence, how to make money podcasting. Because if there's one question that I guess get asked over and over and over again, it's how do you make money podcasting? And um, there are many, many ways that you can do that. And as a matter of fact, one of the things I'm going to share with you um, at the end of this uh, presentation, the next uh, 40 minutes or so, um, or whatever it is, whatever times, hey, Scott, how much time do I have exactly? I guess I forgot to ask you that. You're good till, uh, you got, you, well, you have an hour 15 and you're only seven minutes into it. So you get an hour and eight minutes left. Okay, great. So I'll be well below that in terms of presentation. So I can allow you guys as much time as you want to ask questions at all. Uh, but I wanted to share with you at, at the end of this, at the end of this slide deck, I'm going to share with you a gift and the gift is going to be um, a, a compilation of a handful of interviews that I have done from five of the most of the top podcasters that I have interviewed uh, in my first couple of years when I was in that mode, that learning mode of trying to figure out what it takes to be a successful podcaster. And what's interesting about it is, and I'll get to this towards the end of the presentation as well. Uh, what's interesting about it is there are, there are a few ways and a few goals that you want to have in your head as you're listening to this presentation. Number one, you want to think about the goals that you have set for yourself. Is one of the goals to build community, meaning do you want to have a bigger community? Do you want to build influence, meaning do you want to be one of the go-to people in your, in your industry or in your space? Um, or three, do you want to make money? And there's money is not a four letter word. Money is okay to if you if you're interested in doing this. Uh, so I ask you as you're thinking about and as you're working through this as, as you're established podcasters now think about it. If you're a new podcaster getting into the into the world of podcasting, think about the answer to this question. If you had to prioritize whether you were doing this for influence, for building community or building your bank account money, prioritize those and just take a quick second. And Scott, I'm hoping you can help me out here because I'm going to ask them to just share that top priority and yep. just throw it into the, should they throw it in the chat box, Scott? Or you yep. want them to put throw it in the there? chat box, Q and A, whichever one works best. I can throw that up there for throw you. Throw it in the chat box. Let me know influence community or money. And then uh, when Scott, you just grab a couple of those answers as I'm sharing this and I don't need them right this moment, but as we go through, you just let me know what. Uh, yeah, what got a couple of communities, are. influence. Okay, excellent. Everybody wants money, but they don't want to be that one that shots it out there, right? <laughs> okay, so so that's great because because that's one of the things I always share. And one of these the spots that I stay and I really focused on this is I, I'm going to tell you right out of the gate, I wanted to do it to make money. The problem that I had was that um, I didn't really know how to make money podcasting. And, uh, and again, I'll tell you a little bit more about my story and, uh, and, and so forth. But again, influence, community, or money, put your top priority in there and just enter it into the chat box. And as we get to that portion of my uh, presentation, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll start to collect those answers as well. So let me go a little bit deeper and tell you a little bit about my backstory. In 1984, I filled in for a friend of mine at a place called The Straw Boss, which is a, uh, a Holiday Inn bar in College Park, Maryland. 1984, I was a junior in college. Uh, and um, she asked me to fill in for her as a, uh, as a DJ for that. And I used her equipment. I used her records. I loved music, but I didn't really know how to do anything with music other than put a record on the turntable at that time. I put the record on the turntable. And the moment that I did that, and I believe the song was something like it was a Stevie Wonder tune. And I think it was either Sir Duke or Do I Do or one of those. And I was hooked, not because I loved the music, but because I loved the reaction that I got from the dance floor. People were dancing. I was in control. I didn't need to be in the party, but I could be a part of the party. I didn't need to dance or talk to anybody or be at the bar drinking because I didn't like any of those things at that time. But I love the control factor that I was able to get from being on that dance floor. So that was in 1984. 1992, I started to DJ a little bit more part time. I had always DJed, but uh, moved back to Baltimore from, uh, from New Jersey at the time. And my hometown is Baltimore. My brother was DJing for a company and he said, hey, can you help me out? Uh, by, by lifting some of the equipment, Man, ended up lifting equipment for him for about a year, taking it from gig to gig with him to help him out as his assistant. So that was in somewhere in the early 90s, around 92, 93, I did my first bar mitzvah. 
And then I get, got hooked on all of the games and the activities and the fun and the control that I had over the kids and the adults that were at this party. The beautiful thing is when you do something good in the bar mitzvah world, it spreads like wildfire. So my career between 92, 93, somewhere in there and 97 exploded. I started to do 50 to 100 gigs every year. Uh, and I did that for from 1997 until about 2012. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how many years that was, probably somewhere between 15, 17, wow. something like that. It was crazy. I made an, an amazing living working one day a week. I was known as the bar mitzvah king in the Washington, D.C. marketplace. And uh, I loved it. I loved the money that it was able to provide. I loved the, um, the level of business growth that I was able to get, all of the stories that I was able to create. But it wasn't really filling my cup, that cup of am I am I really making an impact in the world? Am I really making a difference? So in 1993, I had an idea and that idea was to take all of the business skills, the business knowledge that I had in the uh, in in the 15 or 20 years preceding that. And I wanted to do something. I just didn't know what. So I met with my financial planner, Michael. And in that moment, Michael said to me, he said, just be on the lookout for opportunity. Now, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do, but I had an idea that I wanted to do something. So he said, just be on the lookout for an opportunity. So about six months later, that was March, about August of that same year, I met this guy speaking from stage. His name is Ryan Estes. And Ryan was talking at a National Association for Catering Events event in uh, Chicago. And it wasn't what uh, Ryan was saying, but how he was saying it. He was running back and forth across the stage. He was engaging the crowd. He was enthusiastic. He was loving it. And I could tell he was loving it. So I was that guy, just like that 2.3 student in college. I was that guy that really didn't feel like I wanted to learn about what the subject matter was, but I was kind of like the fly on the wall, just observing. So at the end of his presentation, I went up to him and I started asking him questions about his professional speaking business. He shared with me the idea of becoming a professional speaker. And as we were talking, I was getting enthusiastic and I was got that feeling in my gut. You know, that gut feeling that you get when you think about the stuff that you really want to do. Well, that gut feeling told me this is what you want to do. You want to become a professional speaker. So I did what anybody would do when they are trying to learn about something. And um, I became a student of professional speaking. I was watching YouTube videos. I was uh, looking at every free download that I could get. I was uh, talking to other National, Asso uh, National Speaker Association um, uh, uh, members. I was talking to them about how they do what they do. And Ryan had said, when I reached out to him again, Ryan had said, hey, your best bet is probably to hire a speaking coach. My coach is Jane Atkinson. So about uh, maybe two or three weeks later, I was on the phone with Jane and then we ended up, I ended up hiring her and that was my first investment into the professional speaking business. Now, Jane uh, not only would share my message, help me pick my lane, determine what I wanted to do, my message, my platform, all of the things that I needed to do in, uh, in the beginning of my professional speaking career, but she also planted a seed in my brain. That seed was, in order to be a high paid, those were the key words, a high paid professional speaker, you need to write a book. I'm thinking, Okay, a book. This is cool. I don't even like writing, but this, this could possibly be something I want to do. So she said, uh, she said, you want to write a book. And not only do you want to write a book, Doug, but you have to write a best-selling book. And I'm thinking, oh, crap. I don't even like to write you know, love notes to my girlfriend. At, my at the time, it was uh, my wife. I have since been divorced, but uh, I didn't even like writing love notes to my, to my wife at the time. But I'm thinking, okay, but, but I will see what this is all about. So I started to do the same research I did for becoming a professional speaker. I did to become a, uh, a writer. And how do you become a best-selling author? So Google was my best friend. I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching. Um, I, uh, I coincidentally ran into somebody that was a local member of my synagogue. Um, and, uh, and he said to me, Brian Jollis is his name. And he said, hey, I know you're a professional speaker and I see that you have written a, uh, you know, a bunch of stuff on your, on your uh, website as well. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Now talk about law of attraction. 
<laughs> so Brian says to me, and this is funny. Brian says to me, I have a cousin, and I know that he has written a lot of best, a lot of uh, very popular books, maybe best selling books at the time, but a very, a lot of very popular books. You may want to talk to him. I know he's getting into the coaching business, and I had spent probably most of my uh, most of my money on the professional speaking coach. But I said, all right, let's give it a shot. Let's see what it's all about. His cousin's name is Rob Jollis, and I called Rob, and Rob said. Hey, I'd be willing to trade you uh, um, a uh, some services for services. You teach me, and I can't even remember what it was at the time. You teach me X, Y, and oh, you become my first uh, my first uh, book writing um, student. Provide me a positive testimonial, and uh, and I'll help you write a book. I'll coach you through it. He said, but you mu- you got to make one promise to me. He said, you got to do what I tell you to do. And I said, okay, well, I'm at least a good student. If I want to be able to do something successfully, I'm going to you know, grab it by the horns and I'm going to get rolling here. So he said, you're going to have to write 10 pages a week for the next 20. You're going to have to write 200 pages. And we're going to do it in the next, uh, in the next 20 weeks. And I keep thinking, and as I'm doing the math, okay, 10 pages a week for the next 20 weeks. And something clicked at that point. It said, I said, one and a half pages a day. That's about 1,500, it's 1500 words a day. I said, I can do that. So I set about the, the task and the goal of writing a book. I wasn't worried about the bestseller thing yet. <clears throat> I just wanted to focus on getting this book out. Well, 20 weeks later and 200 pages later, I did write that book. After it was edited down, it became 165 pages. Our next goal was to shop for a publisher. We did, and I found a publisher, Motivational Press, to, act, to eventually publish my book. Motivational Press had a bestseller, bestseller program on their agenda, and they sold me into the idea of becoming a bestseller through their program. Well, we're now uh, five years later, um, thousands of books later sold. Uh, I, the book became number one in three categories for seven weeks on the Amazon bestseller chart. And everything that I laid out from the, from the moment that I hit that light bulb moment on the far left side of your screen till the time I became a professional speaker, to the time that I wrote my book <clears throat> came true. So the next part of my journey involved me having to promote my book. Well, I had spent all my money on my professional speaking, um, my professional speaking uh, coach, putting the components. There was some design work that was involved. There was some editing that was involved. So I didn't have a lot of money to invest in anything promotion wise. So I knew that there was uh, the ability, I had the ability to hire a PR company or a publicist, and I really didn't want to hire a PR company or a publicist because they were charging anywhere between $2,500 to $3,500 a month. So I figured maybe I could get one, squeak one month away out of it, but it wasn't really going to do anything. So I went to my partner, a friend of mine, a good guy at the time, he wasn't my partner, Strickland Bonner. And I said, hey, Strick, I just wrote this book. I have this new speaking career. You know all about it. And Strickland is a, was a, um, uh, a guitar player in a band that was represented by the same agency that represented my DJ business. And I said, I would love to do a podcast. Would you be open to doing that with me? I really don't know anything about podcasting. Can you help me do that to promote my speaking business and my book? Now, Strick had no business idea of what, how, what he was going to get out of it, but he loved the idea of putting together a plan. He was the president of Washington Talent Agency at the time, and he thought, hey, he's got some business experience to share. Maybe we can figure out how to make a professional speaking career out of it, or he would follow in my coattails and, and do that, and he was fine with that. So that was in February of 2015, if I got all my dates correct. Um, what happened when we launched the business, uh, launched the podcast, we really had no idea what we were doing. We just kept putting out content. We kept pivoting. We kept changing our format. We kept changing the message. We kept changing all of the things, our offer. We really didn't have a solid offer other than my book and my speaking business, but that didn't matter. We were excited about it and we kept rolling in. It took us 17 months uh, to make our first cent uh, on our podcast. And that first cent was literally our first cent. I mean, it actually was 200 cents. I sold my <laughs> first book two years, pretty much 17, 18 months into that, a year and a half into it. I sold my book through uh, the podcast. And that got me thinking if I could sell one book, why couldn't I sell five books or 10 books or 100 books or 1000 books. So we really worked very hard at coming up with a call to action that would be um, very uh, clear precise, all of the things that you need in order to be able to sell products and services on your, um, on your podcast. Well, what ended up happening was through, as a result of building a community, and at that time we had a fairly small community, we had had a, a total of about 20,000 downloads over that 17 months. And if you do, do the math, 
I don't know what the math is. I think it comes to a couple hundred listeners per episode or something like that. So we ended up having a couple hundred listeners per episode, some of them buying books, some of them hiring me to be a professional speaker. But we had this one guy specifically, his name is Lou Diamond. And I think Scott, you probably know Lou. Oh yeah, Lou's a great guy. Lou's a great guy as well. Lou has a show called Thrive Loud. And at the time he didn't have a show, but what Lou had said to me was, Hey, Doug, I see that you built your podcast. I don't know how successful you've been at it, but I'm willing to take a gamble here. Would you just teach me how to build my podcast? And I said, sure, Lou, I just have a, one problem. I would have no idea how much I would charge you in order to do that. So Lou and I discussed it and we decided on a figure and I don't even remember what the figure was, but we decided on a figure and we started the Turnkey Podcast Production Company. And that was in 2000, late 2016, I think early 2017, or no, I think it was 2017, the beginning of 2017, we started Turnkey Podcast. Since then, it's interesting what happens. We talk about these hidden gifts that you get as a result of podcasting. While I went into podcasting to promote my speaking business and my book uh, and the podcast, Turnkey Podcast actually ended up being the reason the biggest thing that we ended up getting out of the nice guys on business. And if you think of your podcast as, as looking at the slide now, if you, if you think of your podcast as the center of your hub, everything can be promoted through your podcast. I had a book can be promoted through the podcast. I had a speaking business and have a speaking business can be promoted through the podcast. I have a production company can be uh, promoted through the podcast. I have ideas. They all can be promoted through the podcast. So I really started to focus on what are these other things that I could do? And then I started to develop the ways in which I could make money podcasting. So let me come back to the, uh, the chat box for a second, um, uh, Scott, and share with me who in there was interested in, commu or not who, but uh, how many people were interested in the money side of podcasting? Was it a smaller number than the other couple? Yeah, it was definitely, but uh, we had some people are very honest, like, no, I want it, but they are also understand that influence and community leads to the money side of things too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for those of you that are focused on the money side of things, look at it this way. And just for a second, I'm just going to focus on the money. Joint venture partnerships will come as a result of you having a podcast. I have, um, I have done now 1,020 episodes uh, we're three and a half, a little over three and a half million downloads later, 700 of those 1,020 uh, po podcast inter uh, episodes were interviews. Now, my biggest gift, my hidden gift that I have gotten out of this have been those 700 connections that I have with industry influencers. I mean, if you do it for nothing other than a, the specific purpose of getting coaching, I've received so much free coaching from my show because I have literally the industry influencers sitting in the guest chair, you know, three, four, five hours a week sharing their stories because I did five, I was doing five interviews. Now we do three interviews a week. Um, so I was getting the industry influencers and insiders sharing their stories and sharing all of the great things that they had to say uh, with me directly. And I could put my, uh, my business scenarios in front of them, helping my community that was listening to my podcast, learn about the ways in which they could grow their business too, using my business as an example. So if you don't think that you, if nothing else that you get out of it, look at, from, look at it from the uh, monetary perspective. If you make no money from your podcast, the free coaching that you are going to get is a hidden gift alone. That being said, that isn't the only thing that you're going to get. You're going to build relationships that are going to be able to help you with joint venture partnerships. You're going to, uh, to, to strike up some relationships that are going to provide you with affiliate relationships that are meaning um, services that are closely aligned to your services, people that come on your show. You're going to end up moving some of their products, making a commission every time one of those products um, is sold. Also, keep in mind that your content is evergreen content. So it's always up on the internet. 1,050, uh, 1,020 episodes have lived on the internet for years and years and years, the earlier ones. And those products and services are still being sold. As a matter of fact, I have not promoted my book on my podcast, I would say probably within the last two years. I mean, there is a link in my show notes for it, but all of the episodes that were early on, I've promoted, you know, there's only so many things you can promote in one episode. In my book, be being a $2 win if it's sold through Amazon, a $20 win if it's sold directly through my website, um, that is not on the top end of my list of things I want to sell. I would love to sell on my podcast thousands of dollars in services so I get a much bigger cut. 
However, not having mentioned my book on my podcast for probably at least the last two years, I woke up this morning to a $20 sale of my book. Not a big deal, but proving that passively that income that lives on and on and on forever. Plus a, a, uh, a, uh, a couple of online courses that I promote every day I'm working up to. And, and, and in my house, this is what we get. Whenever I ring that bell, that's a sale. And that sale is happening usually two, three, four, five times a day. And these aren't just $20 sales, $2 sales. These could be 50, 100, $1,000 sales for me doing nothing more. If I stopped doing my podcast right now, those 1,020 episodes would still be living on the internet and they'd still be living on Apple podcasts and they would still be living in, um, in evergreen content space that would allow me to make money. And since the nice guys in business podcast has started other things, other interests have come along my way. I have a 1965 Mustang. I started a show called Ford Mustang, the early years podcast. Uh, I enjoy um, growing in relationships. I have a, a show that I co-host with my girlfriend, JJ. It's called Women, Men, and Relationships. Uh, I have a show that, um, that I was trying a, a process out uh, of monetization before launch. Again, something we can talk about a little bit as well. That monetization th before launch came in, in the form of a show called The Biz Whiz Podcast, which was born out of a conference that I went to making $40,000 before I even launched the show. Um, I started a show called, um, called uh, Human with Resources, uh, being hired as an outside host from another company that wanted me to host a show just to see if I could, if I could speak intelligently about a topic I knew nothing about, you know, doing some, some small research. I am a research case study in action. I'm a podcasting junkie. And I'll tell you that if you focus on this, not as a hobby, but as a business, you will get business results. If you look at this as a podcast is this little thing that I have on the side that I'm interviewing people. I'm trying to figure it out. You will get exactly those results, which may be no results. If you focus on making an integral part of your business plan, your marketing plan, your business development plan, your lead generation plan, your joint venture partnership plan, your affiliate plan, your donation plan, your call to action plan. If you put those seven or eight things in place that I just mentioned, you can turn this into a mid six figure, seven figure business without any issue at all. Will it take time? Absolutely. Will it take effort? 100%. Is it worth it? Like I said, I was a professional speaker traveling all over the country, getting on planes, flying, going places, doing my thing for a one hour or a 45 minute speech, making good money, but traveling a day, doing the 45 minute speech, coming down off of the adrenaline that that pumps through your veins, coming back home another day to travel home. I was taking two and a half days. If I was taking my time, one and a half days is up. If I really wanted to have the anxiety kicked up a notch. So two and a half days making the same amount of money that I can make in an hour in my pajamas from my house. Now you pick. So for me, it was all about trying to figure out how to maximize, maximize my time. And the joke that I always share with my, my clients is we have a choice. The choice is you can use, do this as a hobby with hobby results. You can do this as a business with business results. But the question would be, and I'll ask you this and put this in the chat box also, if we could, uh, Scott, I'd love to know the answer to this. If you could make $5,000 every time, forget where the five grand is coming from, but let's just say if you could make $5,000 every time you opened up this microphone, how many times a week do you want to open up this microphone? So just curious, put in the chat box the answer to that question. If you can make five grand every time you open up that microphone, how many times do you want to open up that microphone in the course of the week? And then Scott, just as, as uh, answers are coming and just let me know because I'm pretty yeah, curious what people- as possible. <laughs> as, many, as many as possible, that's right. We got yeah. 10 from Nancy, which is a great week as well. Yep, yep. So- so that would be, if you could make 50 grand a week doing your podcast, how cool would that be? So 
I, ha- I can't quite say that I've done 10 episodes, 10 interviews a week with my podcast, but I would love to know if, uh, if you had the stamina and the capability to do 10 interviews in the course of your week. It does, does require a lot of effort to do it, which is exactly why we were up to five, five episodes a week, three of those being interview episodes. And in some weeks, we absolutely were making $15,000 a week. That is, uh, is in the dust right now. We are well beyond that and looking forward to making a lot more money with our podcast. Uh, down the road as well. Any more numbers coming in? 10. Jace's 10 as well, which is funny. Yep. That's cool. Yep. 10 episodes a week, $50,000 a week. Yes. Can you do it? Will it require effort? What effort would be required to make $50,000? People get into the podcasting world and I always share with them and I'll share some myths with you now, but see people get into the podcasting space and they hold it to a different light as anything else. They say, Hey, I've been doing this for six months now and I haven't made any money. What's up? Well, okay, let's talk about it this way. You've spent 20 minutes a week building your podcast. Do you think in the in the four hours that you've spent over the last six months, do you think that you should be making any money from this? How about putting some effort into it and you can make some money? So at this point, here's where we are in our run. We're three and a half million or so downloads for our podcast, The Nice Guys on Business. We're listened to in 175 countries. We have a thousand episodes, nearly seven. It's actually over 700 interviews at this point. I encourage you, to get into the podcasting space if you're not already in, because it is a game changer. If you are in the podcasting space, and one of the links that I'll give you at the end, if you're in the podcasting space, I have a quiz, and the quiz is, do you have what it takes to make a six-figure income from podcasting? Because I'm really curious if you are. So, Scott, any questions coming in that I that I need to you're tackle good. at you're this point? Good, okay, cool. So let's share what, uh, what the biggest myths are, because not only were these myths that I had, and these were disbelief, these were things that were just not true when I got into podcasting, but many of my clients, I own a podcast production company. Many of my clients come to me with these, with these myths. Now, these are the things that were probably holding most people back from podcasting. I'm going to zip through the myths, and then I'm going to get into the truths and share some case studies for some other people. And then I'm going to talk to you about the components of a successful podcast after that. All right. Myth number one, launching a podcast requires a lot of expensive equipment, complicated equipment. I don't have the time to launch a show or maintain it. So let's start with that second one first. If I said before, every time you open up that microphone, would you be willing to invest a little bit of time and effort and energy to open up that microphone once a week, twice a week, three times a week, whatever it says, whatever it takes. Also, launching a podcast requires a lot of expensive and complicated equipment. I'm using the same equipment. I don't know if you can see that microphone, if my picture is in there at all, but I, yeah. use, a, I use a microphone. It's called the Yeti Blue, uh, the Blue Yeti microphone. I think it was 130 bucks when I bought it. A swing arm from R-O-D-E, Rode or Rode. Um, and uh, I think that was 99 bucks. A, a shock mount, I think that was maybe 40 or $50. So all told, I have about $300 invested in my podcasting business. I've been using the same mic- oh, my, uh, my earbuds. I had these for my, uh, you remember a Walkman? Were you ever using a Walkman? Yes. <laughs> so for my, I think this is my Walkman earbuds. So I have my, uh, my Walkman earbuds, my microphone, my swing arm, my pop filter, and my $2, uh, my $2 pop filter, and my uh, whatever, $40 or $50 shock mount. Altogether, if I've spent $300 on this, that would have been considered a lot of money. So um, there's not a lot of tech knowledge that you have to have for this. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't people that try to complicate things. Some people put, I don't, Scott, do you have like a lot of equipment between your face and your computer to help get the sound and all that stuff set up? No, I have a Blue Yeti mic. And that's <laughs> okay. About it. How much did you spend on How much did you spend on equipment? Any idea? Uh, I, you know, I spent 125 bucks on the Yeti, I think for Best Buy. And then I got a, hundred dollar logitech webcam yeah so uh so uh, what do you call it the uh social light so it lights up the round light in front of me too that was that was probably the most yeah yeah so so all in you're probably a few hundred you're under a thousand dollars in oh yeah okay so everybody that's listening to this right now know that you could be in for a lot less than a thousand dollars probably a lot less than five hundred dollars to start yours your show and and i think in my case i was in for uh i was in for uh maybe 300 bucks Myth number two, only popular podcasts with big communities make money, build influence. In other words, I'm not a celebrity or have a big list, so I can't make an impact podcasting. I would just use Scott and myself, and I'm going to use myself more as the example because Scott, I'm sure, had an audience before. I had a list of exactly 
zero when I started podcasting. Scott, you probably had a bigger list though, didn't you? I did. I did have a pretty good list because I've been speaking. But as, as, if you think back to what I started, I started with doing webinars, which are kind of podcasts before podcasts. You know what I mean? Yep. So I had no list, but neither Scott nor I are Ron Burgundy, Tim Ferriss, uh, Joe, Anthony, Rogan. Uh, uh, Joe Rogan, right? These guys are getting millions and millions and millions of downloads every episode. Um, I'll get into a little bit more about the money in just a moment, but, uh, but uh, meaning that um, the, the celebrity status in just a moment and the fact that you don't have to have or you really don't want to be a celebrity uh, when you start a podcast. And I'll explain why in just a second. And then third myth, I'm not naturally outgoing. So I don't know how to make a podcast that would be interesting or exciting to entice listeners. That one is just complete bullshit. If you know how to talk to people, if you know how to have a conversation, and if you know how to be bad at something until you get good at it, then you will be great at podcasting as well. So I'm going to take these three myths. I'm going to turn them upside down and tell you the, the top three secrets why podcasting is a space that you should be getting into. Number one, or if you're into it, the, the one of the spaces that you need to really start to perfect a little bit more if you're not making any money or you're not an influencer yet or you haven't built a huge community, let me share the ways in which you can do all three of those things. So secret number one, equipment and time. Technically, there's actually very little equipment. We just spend time in that. Uh, we have a formula. There is a formula that's out there. It's the ultimate podcast launch formula, which I'll share with you a little bit later. Um, in less than a weekend, you'll be able to record your first episode and get up and rolling. Uh, and as a matter of fact, let's take Karen Briscoe, one of our um, one of our clients, uh, as an example. And she has a host. She hosts a show called Five Minute Success, and she says the ultimate podcast launch formula helped me minimize the learning curve. I came out of the gate strong, and the lessons learned continue to be essential to my podcast success. Karen's a great example of someone that has completely integrated the podcast into her world. She uses it not only to promote her real estate business and her five minute success in real estate book, but she uses it to promote everything, every project, every joint venture thing that she is working on. And she does it very successfully. I think she's a couple hundred episodes into her run right now, and she's very successful at podcasting. Secret number two about celebrity status. The less celebrity you are, the more relatable you are to your audience. Remember, I talked about Joe Rogan. I was talking about Tim Ferriss, the Ron Burgundies of the world that get millions of downloads. Who's relatable? You, me, Scott? Who's, who is more relatable than, than, uh, than a normal guy, your average guy on the street that's got the same problems and the same issues that you're dealing with in life? Or a guy like Tim Ferriss, who works four hours a week through his book called The Four Hour Work Week. Who, in your opinion, as you're listening to this and participating in this in this webinar, who is more relatable to a community than uh, than uh, than me or Scott? I can say without any hesitation at all that I would probably venture to say that while those guys are great and they have a great message, I think they have forgotten what it is to be the little guy. I think that they get most of their money also through advertising and sponsorship, making tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per episode on sponsorship. The industry standard shows you something like for every thousand listeners that you have, you're going to make anywhere between 15 to $20 uh, per thousand listeners for an advertising spot on your show. The average show gets less than 50 listeners per episode. A good show is getting anywhere between 500 and 1,000 downloads per episode. An excellent show is getting about 2,000 to 5,000 downloads per episode. So let's take the average show at about 100 listeners per show. Now, again, don't look at that as a failure or somebody that's not achieving success in the podcasting business. Imagine filling a conference room with 100 people once a week to share your message. I'd say that's pretty successful. But from an industry perspective and an ad advertising perspective, the average person is going to make somewhere between $5 and $15 per spot, per advertising spot on their show. So I would highly encourage you, do not focus on the Tim Ferrisses, the Ron Burgundies, the uh, Anthony Robbins, any of those guys when it comes to um, uh, when it, Joe Rogan's, those guys are making more money in advertising and sponsorship. And they don't, it doesn't even matter if they're moving any other products because of the money that they're making from their show from advertising. About celebrity status, the less celebrity you are, the more relatable you are to your audience, the easier you will be to convert those audience members into believers in your message. Uh, and I believe that to be 100% true as well. 
Let's take a look at a guy. We, 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 uh, we mentioned him earlier. His name is Lou Diamond. He has a show called Thrive Loud, and he was our first client. Remember, our first client from Turnkey. The formula, the, the ultimate podcast launch formula, it requires zero popularity. Simply put, it's a system that took me, same as I, he had, he had zero, a list of zero, took me from $0 to $300,000 in under two years with my podcast. This is truly the ultimate formula for success in podcasting. And then secret number three, the, the, the real truth behind podcasting about being outgoing. Remember, it's, it, we said, I'm not outgoing. I don't really know how to entice a listener to do anything or, or to even engage an audience member or an engaged member of my, uh, that would be sitting in a guest that would be in the guest chair about being outgoing. It's not about personality. It's about plugging into a formula that works. You just need structure and a system with proven results. And it's true. The idea behind it is you need a system and you need a structure that has proven results and you need to be able to get there as quickly as you possibly can. Don't spend 17 or 18 months the way that we did in order to build your podcast. There is a proven system. There are many systems that are out there. Ours is just one, but plug yourself into a system that works and encourages you. And it holds you accountable, creates um, uh, you know, some level of community for you, whatever it is that you need coaching, either group coaching, individual coaching, something that makes sense for you, plug yourself into a system that works. And I use uh, uh, Virginia Muskies as my example. She has a show called Business by Referral. If you can make friends, you can be a successful podcaster. Your success actually has nothing to do with you being outgoing or having charisma. It actually has nothing to do with you at all. It's all about getting to know your guest, helping them shine and building a relationship. Ultimately, that's what your podcast is. It's a relationship microwave oven. You put somebody on your show, you share their message, you're building community, you're building influence through sharing their message with your community, you're building a relationship with the guest that's seated in the, in the uh, let's call it the hot seat, the interview chair. So you're building a relationship with that guest. And, um, and ultimately, that is, um, that is what you're trying to do by having your podcast. Now, keep in mind, if you're doing it because you're promoting a speaking business or you're promoting a coaching business or a consulting business or a book, that's great. And that will get you out of the gate. That'll get you started. And that will have you your head on and, and motivated to doing something, you know, to get the podcast launched. Keep open, keep your, keep your mind open for the, the opportunities that are actually going to be finding their, their ways to you through the podcasting world. If you have questions as I'm going through this, because I'm about to go into what the formula is really all about uh, and how to successfully launch a podcast or how to make sure that if you have an existing podcast, that you're really sharing it in a way that is, um, that is professional, uh, sounds good, uh, looks good feels good to those that are listening, just go ahead and enter any questions that you may have in the chat box. But if there are none, then I will keep going. And Scott, I'm, I'm not keeping an eye on questions. So let me know if there's anything that's in there now. We'll do. We'll do. All right, let's keep it rolling. I'm going to take a little drink of water here for just a second, and then we'll get onto that. Okay, let's continue on. So before getting started with podcasting, and in this particular case, if you're already started, um, can we just have have those enter that those that are tuned in here, Scott? If they're if they could enter into the chat box, do you have an existing podcast? I just want to know how to kind of uh, gear my my message for the next couple of slides. Do you have a podcast that's existing or not? Just put yes if you do have a podcast. Or no, if you don't already have a podcast, please. I'd love to know that answer. Yeah, we've got about half of those that are online here, are live uh, on the Zoom that are podcasters from knowing them. Okay, cool. All right, so 50-50 uh, so so far. And again, as, as I'm going through this, if you have a podcast, just hit yes. If you don't have a podcast, hit no. And then I'll share these uh, next couple of slides with you. Because before you either get started podcasting or as you are into your run of podcasting right now, think about, um, whether you feel like you have been um, successful at achieving the things, the goals that you had set when you started podcasting. And let's talk about that for just a second. And I'm going to give you a couple of tricks for those existing podcasters first, and then for those that have not started podcasting yet. For the existing podcasters, by knowing your goals, if your goal is to build influence, grow a community, or make money, the idea is you have to focus on those things when you bring guests on your show. So let me ask another question to the community that's out there, Scott. Um, are those that are doing that, that already have an existing podcast, 
uh, just again, enter in, um, uh, I, I don't want to confuse this with the last question that I asked, but enter in, are you doing interviews or monologue? So just I for interviews and M for monologue would be great. And I'm curious what that answer would be as well. So as you're doing this, I see, I see a couple of, uh, a couple of answers coming in here. So interviews or monologue, I is for interview, M is for monologue. And what do we got in there, Scott? We've got, let's see here. And you can enter your question. Inter both interview, monologue, a little bit of both from uh, most of those that are interviews. All right, cool. So as you're doing an interview show, uh, let me just say that that is probably one of the um, one of the fastest ways that you can go to build influence, grow your community and make money. And again, let me talk to those that are existing podcasters for just a second. Your interview chair is extremely important. That interview chair is designed to do all three of those things, build influence, grow community, make money. Now, let's talk about that for just a quick second. If, um, if I had a guy, I have a, a show that's uh, an entrepreneur based show. So if I have Ariana Huffington or Gary Vaynerchuk or John Maxwell or Dan Harris from Good Morning America on my show, those guys are all influencers. Now I look at the, the, an interview with someone like that as a way to build my ego, not my ego in my head, but my show's ego. In order to promote those episodes, what I try to do is I try to, uh, to attach myself to an influencer through the interview to help build my influence. So in other words, having a Gary Vaynerchuk, Ariana Huffington, um, uh, John Maxwell on my show, those are all ways for me to build my influence because the best way to build influence is by associating with other people that have influence. So all of the questions, all of the details, all of the subject matter that I'm going to talk about with them is, is it helps me build my influence. Every question that I design around them is going to help promote them, promote their influence. I'm not looking in return for them to do anything with my show. I'm not going to ask them to promote. I'm going to ask them, but I know they're not going to promote my show. I know they're not going to go out of their way to do anything other than show up on. I, I'm not going to make them jump through any hoops in order to get on my show. If a guy like Gary V, although... Um, he had, he had some choice words to say on my show and, and I'll explain that maybe a little bit later, or, or I'll share a link to that show. It was really funny. Um, uh, but, uh, Gary V came on my show. I'm not looking for him to do anything other than show up, share his time and, uh, and help associate me with the influencer status because he is an influencer. So every question, every subject, every topic that I talk about with Gary V is all surrounding the topic of entrepreneurial experience. He's helping me build my influence by him associate by me being able to associate with him. Now let's take the second one. Again, if you have your own show and you have an interview chair, growing community. The important thing about growing community is the best way to grow community is that by have other by having other people on your show that understand and have a big community already. So if I have a guy like um, Steve Ulsher, I invited him on my show at the time that uh, before I knew Steve and, and got involved with New Media Summit, Steve Ulsher was on my show and uh, I knew Steve had a big community. I also knew that Steve um, was a very good promoter and excellent marketer. So I wanted to align myself with Steve so that I could become a uh, or have a big community as well. So Steve ended up posting on his website. He ended up sending out an email or, or, or ended up promoting on social media. Everything that I was doing with the show, I, I continued to promote to him. As a matter of fact, I think before Steve came on, I had what I call my nice guy rules. Rule number one, you have to rate and review the show. You have to subscribe to the show. You have to, uh, you have to uh, give me a... Um, um, uh, uh, let's see, what else did I say? Rate and review. Oh, you have to have a professional microphone. You have to share with me what your plans are to promote my episode. So those are our nice guy rules. So I use those rules for a community builder, not for an influencer, but for a community builder. I use those rules before Steve came on the show as a lever to get him on the show. Got to make sure you have a mic. Got to make sure that you rate and review the show. Got to make sure you listen to an episode. And you have to make sure that you share with me your plans to promote the show. That way, once I get his buy-in to that and I say yes to coming on my show, beyond him coming on the show when the show airs, I can go back to him, a guy like Steve or anybody that is a community builder, and I can say, hey, remember before I invited you on the show, you, you, you shared with me your plans to promote the episode. Here is, you know, I make it as frictionless as, pro as possible. So you want to make sure that you're giving them the tools that they need in order to help 
um, spread the word, spread the influence uh, or spread the um, spread the community love, spread the knowledge of the show so that we can grow our community. Again, completely different approach to that guest as a as an influencer would have uh, just through providing and being a, a um, helping my my show's ego. The third way that you can um, the, the third goal that you can have for your show, again, just talking to those that are uh, that are experienced podcasters already, is uh, by making money from the guests on your show. Well, how do you do that? Well, you don't do that through advertising or sponsorship through a third party. You do that directly through putting someone in that guest seat that has the capability to sponsor the episode by coming on the show, promoting their products and services, and, uh, and talking to your community about what they do. For every sale that they make, you get a percentage of that. For every appearance that they have on your show, you get a percentage of that. You can also say to them, hey, I'd love you to sponsor the episode. Would you be open to sponsor? And everybody gets the question for me, would you be open to sponsoring the episode that your show airs on? And by doing that, you're, put, you're potentially putting $500, $600, $1,500, $1, depending on where you are, from everybody that comes on your show. Does that mean I won't invite them on the show if they don't sponsor their episode? No, that doesn't mean that. It just means that I'm asking the question. I'm selling that guest seat to those that want to potentially sponsor their episode. Does that mean that they're paying for an appearance? I guess in a, in a, in a, uh, in a back, backdoor way, that means that they're paying to be on the show. But at the same time, they're getting extra value. I'm promoting them through the episode. I'm sharing their, their message with my community. Why wouldn't I not? Isn't that the same as a commercial? Why wouldn't I not be able to make money from that? It does not mean that I'm not inviting them on the show if they don't pay to have a sponsorship, to, to have an advertisement or a sponsorship on the show. But it does mean that I ask the question. So before you get into podcasting for just a moment, as I'm talking to those that haven't launched the show, think about the reason or the, re, uh, or, the, um, or the goal that you have for getting into podcasting to begin with. If you said to make money, then keep in mind that one of the ways that you're going to make money is by selling that guest seat into sponsorship. Another way you're going to make money is by selling affiliate relationships to those that are, that are uh, coming on your show that have a message that's closely aligned with you. Another way that you're going to make money is through a call to action to create a, an environment where your community, even a small community, can, uh, can make money. Uh, I mean, a small community can buy the products or services that you are selling. So remember at the beginning when I shared with you a show that we made $40,000 with before we had even launched? Let me explain how that worked so you can see how this could potentially work for you even if you have an existing podcast, or even if you've never started, if you've never podcasted to to uh, to begin with, so we went to this this uh, this conference called New Media Summit. At New Media Summit, we were encouraged to invite the people that were at the at the conference onto our onto our podcast. I really liked a bunch of them, and it made me think about the idea of Hey, hold on a second. I think that if uh, I didn't want to sell the guest seat. That was against the, the New Media Summit rules, so I wasn't going to do that. But it didn't say anything about turning those guests into clients. So what I did was, because there was so many people, there was 100 and I, I think there was 150 people that were in attendance. I think 120 of them had an opportunity to, to pitch me specifically. They were doing the pitches a little bit differently than they do it now. I had 120 people that pitched me their services. Of the 120 people, remember those rules that I was talking about before? You have to subscribe, rate and review, have a professional microphone, share your plans to promote the episode. So 40 of those people actually followed the rules. All 40 of them got on our got on my show. Now, I didn't have room on the Nice Guys on Business podcast, so I created because uh because I didn't want it to take a year for me to get all of them on the show. We had a booked schedule, almost fully booked at the time that I went to New Media Summit. But I did have the ability to create a new show. So I created a show called The Biz Whiz Podcast. Biz Whiz Podcast um, had no episodes out, but I knew how to promote my podcast. Had no episodes, had not even launched. The concept was, was, um, was discussed or determined the morning that I was getting all of these pitches because I knew that there was going to be a lot of people that I, were gonna want, that I was going to want on the show. So remember, 40 of those people ended up coming on the show. After the interview was over, I basically asked a simple question. You know, the simple question was, why is it that you don't have a podcast? Keep in mind that at that point, uh, we had gotten um, uh, Lou Diamond. He was already our first client. 
Lou was thriving in the business and we knew that this is a, this was a formula that was going to work. So when we asked the question, we already knew the basics of how we were going to coach these, anybody that said yes to that question, why don't you have a podcast? Of the 40 people that were there, seven of them became podcast coaching clients of ours. Those 70, before we even launched our, uh, our BizWiz podcast, had, had created an income stream for us that was larger than the Nice Guys on Business podcast had ever created for us. So we knew when we created the BizWiz podcast that that was the way that we were going to really focus on making our biggest money. So all of that is a long about way to say, know your goals before you get into podcasting. If you're going to do it to build influence, awesome. To grow a community, great. To make money, which was our goal, that was terrific also. So the formula will really teach you all of those things. It will really focus you on to how to, how to make money and how to monetize your show. As important to knowing your goals, you got to know your mom, your market, your offer, and your message as well. Before you get into podcasting, you really have to have a very clearly defined... Now, this it could be completely pivoted at some point down the road. Keep in mind, I was a professional speaker and, uh, and an author when I started my podcast, and now I'm a podcast producer full-time that does part-time speaking and very part-time book promotion. So when we started, we knew our market. We knew our offer. Remember, my, my offer was my, uh, was my speaking platform, so professional speaking and my book, and know your message. Know how you present, know what you're going, who you're going to present to, and know how to present your, your message. So I highly encourage you to know your, your market and your offer and your message as well. So I'm going to invite everybody that is here to take advantage of getting to, uh, to understand the formula a little bit better. So the ultimate launch podcast, the ultimate podcast launch formula is really made up of if you have a if you haven't launched a podcast yet, the essential components of a successful podcast before you launch. And if you are an existing podcaster, go back and think about these things and, and determine whether these are a good fit for your show that's in place right now. Do you have apps and equipment that keep it simple? Meaning, do you have a microphone that you're not you know, screwing around with every time that you open up the friggin' mic to do an interview? Do you have an internet connection that's hardwired in? I'm giving you some, you know, background insider secrets, if you call these secrets. Do you have a automated scheduling? Hey, Scott, I'm really curious. Do you have a, do you use a, uh, yeah, you use a scheduler, don't you? Oh, hell yeah. I couldn't do my business without it. Yeah. So not only your business, but, you know, from my perspective, a, to, to run my podcast, um, whether it's collecting money through sponsorship or answering questions and answers that I'm going to ask my, my guest on the show or getting background and contact information, a headshot, all of the parameters by which they have the Zoom link, all of that stuff. If you're not using an automated uh, scheduler or an automated program, what, again, whatever it is, I use um, Acuity, but there's Calendly, there's uh, my big fat schedule, there's, a, there's a, a ton of scheduling programs that are out there. So just know that if you're not using apps and equipment to, uh, to make your life easier, you're wasting your time. You're taking, you're taking a process that if you're doing one interview or one podcast episode a week, and let's say that it takes you, I don't know, 40 minutes, one hour or so to, to record the, uh, the podcast episode. If you're spending five or six or 10 hours a week on that one episode, you're spending way too much time. You should probably come close to, once you get good at it, maybe double the amount of time that you put into the interview. So if you put an hour into the interview, you should be spending another hour doing your promotion and all of the other stuff. Beyond that, if you're spending too much time um, with it, then it's going to create results that are not good for you. You're going to get tangled up in too much technology, tangled up in too many digital things, applications, equipment, all that stuff. You got to keep it simple. So uh, one of the essential components of a successful podcast is having equipment and apps that make your life easy. Naming your show. You got to have a show name that is aligned to your business. The Nice Guys on Business podcast um, is, uh, is a, is a, is a, it's a good name, but it wasn't the name that if I had to rename it now, uh, we have this other show called The Turnkey Podcast, okay? So it's about podcasting, how to create a turnkey podcast. That's my new show. The Nice Guys on Business is a great um, uh, lead generation and business development tool, but the show that we really do focus on now is our turnkey podcast. You also want to have a show description that will entice potential listeners to tune in. 
Uh, Apple Podcasts gives you, I think it's something like 400 characters to share your uh, to share your show description. You want a description that's going to pull listeners in before they even listen to your show. You want something that shares uh, a, um, a a little bit about your business, a little bit about how often you're going to do your podcast, who is the potential great uh, you know best listener for your show, and the formula. The the one of the components is making sure that you do have a uh, a show description that is very very much in alignment with your with your business. Also, you want to make sure as an essential component to a successful podcast that you have cover art uh, that, uh, that portrays the message and the brand that you want to represent. Keep in mind, you also do have a very, very small piece of real estate on, uh, on Apple Podcasts. They don't give you much real estate to work with. It's a small postage stamp size. You don't want to cram too many words. You don't want to put too many fonts. You don't want to put too many colors. You want to create either something that's got a lot of white space or a lot of uh, black space. You want to make sure that uh, your cover art uh, is using all of the real estate that you possibly can. It's talking about real estate, location, location, location. It is in the real estate game of property. It's no different in Apple Podcasts. So you want to also categorize your, uh, your podcast and display that cover art in a category that's, greatly, that's a great representation of, of, um, of what your show is all about. For example, I have a show called Ford Mustang, the early years. If I put that podcast, and I'm going to create an extreme here, but if I put that podcast in the um, religion and spirituality uh, category, because there's, let's say, less, um, uh, less podcasts in that category, which there's not, there's a ton in the religion and spirituality. I think it's the biggest um, category there is. But if I put it in there just to get people's attention, because it's uh because it's a you know it's it's a show that um, you know has a lot of contrast to religion and spirituality. You're not going to get any people to uh, to tune into your show. So if you're an existing podcaster right now and you're not looking at your categories, especially since Apple changed their categories in the last uh, couple of months, go back and look at your categories and determine what your uh, what your 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 best category is. You can do that through the next category, which is. SEO. See what is the best SEO um, category for your uh, for your podcast. If you're a Ford Mustang um, uh, podcast and you're in religion and spirituality, you're not going to get any listeners to uh, to tune into your show through category search. So make sure that you are using a um, uh, a show that is closely aligned and a uh, and cover art and a category that's closely aligned to your message. Also, another essential component of having a successful podcast is to make sure that your open and your close, meaning your intro and your outro, uh, are professionally produced. Even if that's the only thing that you're having professionally produced, make sure that you have a professional open and close because in three seconds, somebody is going to make up their mind whether they like your show or not. And if the first thing that they hear is an unprofessional, non-microphoned, um, staticky, uh, not connected well, uh, different voice, different levels between you and your guest. If they hear that in the first few seconds, they're going to tune out of your show. So I'd highly encourage you to do a professional open and close. Keep in mind also that the music for your show needs to be royalty free. If you put a piece of commercial music on your show, Apple is going to come back through there. They're going to ding you. They're probably going to take your show down temporarily, or if you don't remove it, maybe even permanently. I know that in the early stages, we had uh, we were playing music clips during our show, and YouTube every once in a while they would pull our show off of uh, off of YouTube. For every day that you're off of Apple Podcasts or you're off of YouTube, you are losing a potential to have an a, 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 a an audience member tune into your show. So in the early stages, highly, highly, highly important, especially in the early stages, but even so in the, uh, in the, in the later days, later episodes, you want to make sure that your show doesn't get dinged. So use commercial free music. So an essential component of a successful podcast is making sure that you have uh, non-commercial royalty free music. Next up for an essential component for a successful podcast, you want to make sure that you are uh, creating great show notes. In our particular case with Turnkey Podcast, what we do for many of our clients is we create show notes that's a summary of the episode in a few sentences, a handful of key takeaways, a quote from our, from our guest that was on the show, if it was an interview-based show, and all, of con all the contact information and important links that we shared on our show. All of those things are, are put together to create a keyword-rich, SEO-driven 
show note um, uh, uh, construction. If you do that, you have a much greater chance of you being seen on Google or uh, any other search term search that uh, that your guest is, or your audience potential audience member is doing for your show. SEO keyword rich. If you don't know what those things are, I would highly encourage you again to find a company or find a SEO or keyword um, uh, expert to come in and do an examination of your show notes. If you're not doing any show notes. I definitely would encourage you right now. Google is not indexing on audio. So they're only going by the words that you have in the summary of your, um, of your podcast summary uh, show notes. So make sure that you do that. Also, uh, the final con uh, essential component of a successful podcast, you want to make sure that you are uh, hosting and distributing your, uh, your show properly. Single source hosting is great. You don't want to host your show in too many places. You want to host it in one place that will create the address your host is like the, the lot for your house. Your podcast is the house that you're putting on the lot. Simplecast, Libsyn, uh, there are many different ones. You also want to make sure that you distribute your show properly and through as many uh, places that you can. Apple Podcasts being the 800-pound gorilla, you definitely want to make sure you're distributing your show through Apple Podcasts. There's also Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. There's a bunch of places that, uh, that you can, um, Pandora, that you want to make sure that your podcast is distributed through. So those are the essential components of a successful podcast. I want to share with you now the ultimate podcast launch formula. The launch formula that, um, that, uh, that we have in order to create a successful launch, the formula should include a launched podcast. So in order to get to the, to the tail end of it, you want to make sure you start with the end in mind. You want to have a launched podcast. I always tell my, my clients, never let perfect be the enemy of done. They're all trying to make these perfect welcome episodes, perfect interviews. You're going to be bad until you are good. So you may as well just get used to that in the beginning. Specific focus for your show and an understanding of your market and your offer and your message, as we talked about before. You want to have participation in order to have the best formula for a successful show, participation in an active community, live one-on-one -on -one coaching. You definitely want to have a coach get you through this if you want a professional podcast. Early on in my speaking career and my book career, again, the coach was essential for me to create a, uh, a, a successful platform and a successful book, a best-selling book. You want to have live one-on-one -on -one coaching. You also want to have a peer or group support program that's in place because without those things, it may not be as relatable to you if you're just talking to a coach. While it's great to have a coach from an accountability perspective, it's great to have peer and group coaching as well so that you can understand that everybody has the same issues that you have. Promotion, promotion, promotion is definitely a key to a, a successful launch and a successful launch formula. Promote, 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 recycle, recreate, repeat promotion over and over again. And you want to plug into a system that consistently works. Because of all those things, we've created a system, a formula that really works as well. So all, our ultimate launch uh, formula includes the following items, a comprehensive seven-step uh, process for launching your podcast if you are, don't have a podcast launched already in 48 hours or less, a 60-minute strategy session to help you develop a solid plan for your podcast, a 30-minute pre-launch consultation, because even though we do the consult in the beginning for the discovery and you go through the seven steps self-paced on your own, before you launch, let's make sure that you have a checklist in order to, for you to launch successfully. We also give you lifetime access to our live group coaching calls, which is essential in order to uh, share with your peers things that are, you're doing. Uh, you can ask live Q&A as you've launched your show uh, and make sure that you get out not only of the gate well, but once you've got that car moving, you have it steering in the right direction. We give you access to our Facebook group uh, for sharing and advice. And uh, we have two fast action bonuses for Scott's group today. Uh, you have an appearance on the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Uh, that is a guest position that we would put in your hands just for just for taking advantage of the launch formula. And we're also going to send out a newsletter and promote to our social media community. If you add up all of those pieces of value, it's an $18,250 value. The investment for you is $497. It's a joke because I always, I talk to my team about it all the time. I'm like, hey, we sell a, a one live coaching call for $495. So for $2, you really are getting all of the other things that are involved. We just know that the formula works and we do know that it will launch many successful shows. We're providing that for the first five that get to, uh, to purchase, that, that, uh, that purchase the ultimate launch formula and all of the bonuses. If we sell five, then the, then the, um, then the, uh, the bonuses will expire as well. 
Um, in order to uh, to get those, uh, let's see, did I put on there? Oh, Scott, do you have, I, I think I may have given you the link for that, didn't I? Boom, I just put it in there right now. So they can oh, you're good. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So, so anyway, so Scott will provide the link and I'm like, where did I put the link? I couldn't remember what I do with it. I think you put it in there. So uh, if it, that is something that you decide that you want to take advantage of, Scott is putting in the chat box or, or somewhere on there so you can see it, a, uh, a link to that. Um, the other thing I want to provide to you, as I told you, the, I want to give you an attendance gift for being a part of this as well. We have an attendance gift. Ours is, um, is how to start, grow and profit from podcasting. Uh, I don't, let's see, I can, I can click on it. I can click on this, Scott, and drop that in the chat box. If you want me to, would that That'd be? be great? Yeah. Okay. So let me just click on that and I'm, geez, it's a really long link. So I apologize. I'm going to drop that in the chat box. Let me find it right here. Okay. Sorry about the long link, everybody, but that is the link for the, uh, how to start grow and profit from podcasting. And then the other thing I will share with you too, move that chat box out of the way for a moment. Uh, the other thing I'm going to share with you, let me go back one slide here, is, uh, is the quiz that I was telling you about too. If you're an existing podcaster and you want to see if you have what it takes uh, to make $100,000 or more to make a six-figure income uh, from your podcast as in you're an existing podcaster, I will put that in the chat box too. And you can take advantage of of that. And uh, I think, Scott, if I did everything correctly, I think I, I think I might have done it all. I can't believe I got through all that. In, in Good 40... job, man. Good Jeez. job. We... Good stuff. We got a question here. Um, okay, actually, can you put up the slide with all oh, the things yeah. involved there too? Leave that up there so people can take a notice of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Let me figure out how to do that again. Hold on a second. I got to go to my Zoom screen, share screen again do that and here so you should be seeing my screen again yeah just go and back to slide or two right here yes sir that'd be perfect okay uh, we do have a question jay helms asked the question and gives the testimonial that you provided on the gentleman who produced uh three hundred thousand after two years what was the mix of that revenue if you know oh uh, geez uh i would say that a good percentage of, of Lou's revenue came from uh either joint venture partnerships or call to action just knowing lou and, and his style of business yeah. through selling the services that he had to his small community at the time so you don't have to have a big community to make a big impact with your uh with your show as i as i outlined before yeah and i think i talked to he he's a, a mixture of a, a bit of everything because he, he does a good job with that i mean we've We've done a good job on our end over six figures and it's a mixture of sponsorships and members and then classes and stuff like that. But um, we're, we're pulling in 50 plus grand in sponsorships for the most part. At least. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Now, now tell me about, I'm curious because you have such a fine tuned uh, micro niche niche community. You know, if you had to go by industry standards, what would you say the industry standards would be for, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to ask you any private numbers personally, but uh, I'm curious what the industry standards would pull in for you dollar wise for advertising. Oh, golly. <laughs> uh, a lot. I mean, because we're finance. So finance is always going to be more. One of the things I need to work better on is my Google AdWords stuff with advertising because finance terms rank higher. But what's funny is our podcast ranks higher on Google, higher than our own sponsors. We, we rank higher for our sponsors and they actually rank for themselves in some situations. Yeah. So when you get really good at this, you know, keep in mind a thousand and twenty episodes later, uh, when somebody enters in, I don't know, one of our guests on our show, I don't I don't know how it would rank it. Well, you have a really popular show, so it may not be the same, but take a guest that, uh, that is just promoting that might be new in the, in the podcast world as a guest, enter in their name and hit enter. And oftentimes my show episode yeah. with them on the show will come up before they even come up on their homepage or their website. Yeah, it totally does, man. And, and you do such a great job with your marketing after the event. I mean, I was on episode 889 and you're at 11, 1200 now but you're still continuously marketing on Twitter. So I see it pop up all the time. I go in and retweet it all the time, right, um, right? which is great. But yeah, I mean, that's the thing is it just, it's, it's 24 seven evergreen. Like you said, it's advertising out there. Think how many times you've watched a McDonald's commercial yep. out there with anything going on. It's kind of like that aspect. If you got an episode out and sharing it in all the different places and doing the stuff that Doug is, uh, teaches people, it's, you're going to have success. I mean, I know Karen, Karen's a friend of mine. I've had her on my podcast. I've been on hers. 
uh, just raves about you and uh, goes yeah, on had, and on. It's um, what I would probably encourage, and I know we're short on time, but uh, just to wrap up here, I would encourage everybody to understand if you're in this is potentially to make money and ultimately even influence and, uh, and community building will, will uh, come back to reward you and make you money. Um, if you're in it, it's the diversification of the income that is so essential. It's not just advertising and sponsorship. It's all of the other things, the joint venture partnerships, the calls to action for your services on your show, the, the uh, um, affiliate relationships and advertising and sponsorship. Even some people like my, uh, my Mustang podcast, we get donations from people that, that uh, want to donate just because they want to support the show. It has nothing to do with them wanting to get any additional you know, bang out of it. So uh, while my goal for that passion project, my Mustang podcast, was not to make money, um, people want to give me money, and I'm okay, I'm okay with that, you know. So, uh, the diversification of the income is an essential component to to podcast success as well. And if you're open to the opportunity to do it, then um, then you absolutely can can make money podcasting. Awesome. Any other final questions for Doug before we let him go and get back a, a nap before he's got to start on his day? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Great. I mean, you guys have done this launch stuff. How many podcasts have you launched up uh, so far? I mean, you're in the hundreds, aren't you? Yeah, we. I think we're somewhere around 110 or 120. I don't know exactly the the number in that, and that doesn't even take into account this this uh, fairly new ultimate podcast launch right. formula that we have put in place. The DIY will far eclipse all of the uh, all of the the one on one coaching. The that is going to be a, you know, 15 or 20 of those every month, 30 or 40 of them when we really get cranking and well beyond that once this thing gets, you know, up to speed. Well, the biggest thing I can tell you is the 497 is well worth the price to avoid the mistakes that you make that That's you would true. be trying to do it yourself. That's the thing is the opportunity cost of time loss and overspending, over trying to do it all yourself when you've got somebody who can help guide you through it and hold your hand through it it's much more efficient and effective and, and success in the long run than trying to, Hey, I'm going to be cheap and try to do it all myself. I mean, 497, one of the cheapest prices we've ever seen out there with a launch formula and, and launch package for you. Well, we here. wanted to make it a no brainer for people as much as we possibly could to, to do it. Because like I said, we sell our, I sell a live, uh, a one-on-one -on -one coaching call for $495 right now, because um, I know that that is a, a, a something that would be of value to, to clients. Now, this ultimate podcast launch formula, it will not be at 497 for a long time. That's yeah, why right. we put this seven day expiration date on it. We think that it's going to be somewhere in the $1,500 to $2,000 range yeah. once we get it cranking, but we're really working hard to get this thing out of the gate uh, and, uh, and make a big splash with it. Yeah. Uh, Tony says that is cheap. It's a great price. Michelle Smith says, yes. Loving what you did. <laughs> Hey, is that Michelle Smith from the Birth Ease podcast? Yes, it is. Hey, yeah. Michelle, glad to have you here. Yeah, Michelle, we uh, we launched her show and she's doing great. And uh, she was so kind to uh, to send a really nice uh, text message to me after she was on your uh, on your event. You had an event last night. We had eight hours of podcasters pitching their podcast. So we had uh, thirty podcasters from basically twelve to eight p.m. an eight hour live stream, basically where they all got fifteen minutes to share nice. the show and, and talk about it. Michelle did a, a tremendous job with her pitch. Yeah, Michelle definitely has her act together. She understands the the power of the podcast and she understands really what her show is all about. She's great. She understands, again, she knows her mom, her market, her offer, and her message. That is so critical to know those three things when you get into podcasting or and focusing on those as you as you roll your uh, your show out. Okay, mom, market and message. What was the O? Offer. You got to know what your offer is. You got nice. to understand like your call to action. Get to know your mom, your market, your offer, and your message. Very good stuff. Good stuff. Well, hey, Doug, thanks so much for coming on Mass Media Podcast and really giving some great nuggets this morning and provide some of really great value to people out there, guys. 497 to help get rocking off. If you're sitting on the sidelines, hey, it's worth doing that just to get a phone call to figure out if there's something. Everybody's got an expertise in them. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, what your focus is. We've all got a podcast inside of us. So, yeah. Yeah. Final piece of advice is don't let perfect be the enemy of done. I tell this to my clients all the time. Just get the show out. You can't steer a parked car. It's really hard to do from the sidelines in the in the parking lot. Let's get it on the road and uh, and we'll start to help you You know, through our group coaching plan after you get launched. We'll help get you going in, in the right direction. So thank you, Scott, very much. I appreciate being your, uh, being your first up this morning. And I know you got some great guys and girls coming up uh, today as well. I'll tune in a little bit later as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Doug. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.